Well, welcome church history friends. Uh, my name is Barb Walden and it's a joy to welcome our global storytellers and listeners from around the world today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Today's program is the fifth lecture in the 2021 Church History Without Boundaries lecture series, and it is sure to be a great one. Well, joining me today and throughout the series are two wonderful co-hosts, uh, Joey Williams and Wendy Eaton, who I hope are familiar faces by now. Uh, Joey serves as the Mission Center President for the Eastern and Western Europe Mission Centers. So welcome, Joey, and welcome, Wendy, who is behind the scenes answering questions, dropping information in the chat, and solving problems that we hope all of you in the audience never find out about. Wendy is the Administrative Assistant for the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and the Joseph Smith Historic Site. Uh, welcome, Wendy. I'm so happy to have you and Joey here. Well, today's program is being recorded for those who are unable to see it live. We will record all of our online programs throughout the series, and you can locate these videos on our YouTube channel as well as our website. Uh, Wendy will drop the online lectures link in the chat for you. If you're interested in going back and hearing a program you've already heard, or perhaps hearing one for the first time. Our online lectures really would not be possible without generous donors like you, our friends in the audience. You are literally helping to preserve and share church heritage today as donations received throughout the Church History Without Boundaries uh, lecture series will go to preserving and maintaining Community of Christ historic sites. They'll help in hosting our online programs, developing new educational resources, and funding young adults in the Alma Blair Internship Program. The online donation link and mailing address is in the chats. You will also notice that Wendy has dropped today's schedule into the chat. This will give you an idea of what to expect for today's program. So please remember to take full advantage of the chat feature throughout the lecture today and continue to post your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. When our guest speakers finish, we will go first to the questions that are already in the queue. And that's it for the announcements today. I'll turn things over to Joey, our host, to begin today's program. Thank you, Joey. Well, thank you, Barb. I am so excited to present today's guest speakers who are going to help us explore Community of Christ behind the Iron Curtain. Kirsten Yeska and Ava Erickson are not only great history presenters, but they're some of our finest history makers in Europe. In fact, I can imagine in 50 years, somebody will be doing an online presentation entitled Kirsten Yeska and Ava Erickson, the movers and shakers of Community of Christ in Germany, Norway, and beyond. Who better to share with us than both of these people today. Let me tell you a little bit about these two gifted storytellers. Kirsten was born into the church and as the daughter of the leader of the church in East Germany at that time, church was a big part of her life. She worked full-time for Community of Christ from 1994 to 2005 and served as president of 70 for Europe and Africa from 2000 to 2007. She's now currently a high priest and serves as the ministry coordinator for Norway, where she resides. But last May, the Mission Center approved a call for Kirsten to evangelist, and she will be the first female evangelist to serve in Norway. Ava grew up in East Germany as well, was raised in the Lutheran Church, and joined the RLDS Church in 1991 after many positive experiences at children's and youth camps. Ava met her husband in the U.S. and lived there for many years before returning to Germany in 2005. She's a member of the Standing High Council for Community of Christ and serves as the ministry coordinator for Germany. Kirsten and Ava met in their youth, were an integral part of church life in East Germany, went to Graceland together, and are still even the very best of friends, even though they're now living in different countries. So Eva and Kirsten, ich heiße euch herzlich willkommen in this lecture series. And I'm now gonna turn things over to you as we are all very intrigued to hear the story and history of Community of Christ 
Behind the Iron Curtain. Take it away. Well, thank you, Joey, for the great introductions. Uh, let me share my screen first. There we go. Thank you, Barb, also for the invitation. Kerstin and I had a lot of fun exploring some of our history, talking to people, reading old letters, history books, doing interviews. It was just a lot of fun. And it was also fun to go down memory lane. Initially, we were going to talk about the history of the church in Germany in general, but that proved to be too broad of a topic. And so we narrowed it down to just East Germany and just the time frame from 1961 to 1989, which is the time of the Iron Curtain. Since in German, we usually refer to the wall instead of the Iron Curtain, you will hear us use both terms. Here's an overview of what you can expect today. First of all, we will give you some general history so that you have the relevant background information. We will be talking about some congregations and also key leaders interspersed with personal stories of the people we interviewed. And we will address the importance of camps. And then we will touch on a few other subjects like the situation with the Stasi, official recognition of the church in East Germany and women's ordination. And as a conclusion, we will talk about how church life, despite or with the restrictions that we lived in behind the Iron Curtain, shaped today's, today's church and church leaders. So let's start with a little bit of history. After the Second World War, Germany was divided into four sectors, British, French, American, and Soviet. And Berlin equally was divided into the same four sectors. East Germany and East Berlin, of course, were in the Soviet sector. The German Democratic Republic and the Federal Republic of Germany became independent states in 1949. Living conditions were quite a bit better in the Federal Republic of Germany, and that caused many people from the East to flee to the West. As an example, in the first seven months of 1961 alone, at least 150,000 people fled from the East to the West. That together with some political conflicts led to the events of August 13, 1961, when the borders between the two countries were sealed off. I had a chance to interview Gisela Arndt recently. You can see her in this picture in her home in Berlin. She remembers going to a wedding on August 12, 1961. Let's hear her memory of what, she, what happened on August 12 and 13. In her memory, she will also talk about a Michael, that is her son who was just six weeks old in the middle of August of 1961. And when we came back at six in the morning from the wedding and there tanks were on the road. In the direction of Berlin, tanks were on the road. So when we you know, we came home sooner, there were tanks. And at 6, Michael got his bottle, and the tanks were still on the road. That was on Sunday. And Grandpa, on Sundays, we always went over to the west to church with the Findos. They lived just across from us. And Grandpa was getting dressed when Brother Findo came and said, Julius, might as well take that off again. We can't go. They built a wall. So there you have it. They built a wall. By the 1960s, there were several congregations in all parts of Germany. And even though there already were the two separate countries, East and West Germany, people could still move fairly freely across the border. And so there was a good collaboration between the different congregations. Once August 13 happened, that was not possible anymore, of course. The border was sealed off and left the East German congregations pretty isolated. We will talk about the congregations in East Germany in more detail later on, but just to show you where they were located. We have Brandenburg here, close to Berlin. We have Großreichen, kind of south, and then Dresden in the very south. And then the groups at that time were Grünberg in the north. Grünberg is a group that mostly centered around the Fillinger family. This is a large family who, like many other church families, originally came from Silesia in what today is Poland. Then there was a group in Delitzsch, which is right here, and that was a collection of uh, members from several towns around the Leipzig area. Leipzig is a bigger town, a bigger city in East Germany. And then Senftenberg is right down here, and that later on merged with Großreichen. Sometime during the 1950s, 
several, if not all of the East German groups and congregations were not permitted to meet. There are stories that they continue to meet in secret, but that is not part of our uh, presentation today. In any case, it appears that by 1961, all groups were officially permitted to meet again. I want to talk a bit more about Großreichen, since this is where I grew up. The congregation was officially organized by Fred M. Smith in 1921, so 100 years ago. And it has always been one of the largest congregations in Germany, and that means all of Germany. They had their own building, a wooden barrack, already by 1923. After the Second World War, the congregation grew rapidly and soon counted more than 100 members. So the building was way too small, yet they did not get permission to build a new church building. Applying and reapplying, they eventually were permitted to do so-called value preservation. And you can see on the picture how they literally started building a church with bricks around the old wooden barrack. By the time they got to the roof, however, the authorities became attentive to what was going on. But since there was already so much material used, the economic viewpoint weighed in heavily and they were allowed to continue. They just had to pay a fine. A fun fact is that three months after the opening ceremony, they received the building permit. The opening ceremony was in 1966 and here you can see the brass ensemble of the congregation that gave Ministry of Music. The brass ensemble had existed almost from the very beginning, since 1926, and it was really the pride of the congregation in Großregion. They played for about 50 years until 1979, with just a short pause during the war. The congregation had also a choir almost from the very beginning, Music was just very important in many different ways, and not only in Großreichen. When I was a child, most of the children I knew from church were playing an instrument. It was quite affordable in East Germany to send children to a music school, so this was really easy and encouraged. I learned to play the songs from our church hymnal on the harmonium, a sort of a pump organ, with the help of a church member in our congregation. You can see in the pictures on the right a variety of instruments being played. Music was also part of what brought us closer together as children and youth of the church. We made often music together and were also often asked to give music ministry and services, especially for conferences, family camps and so on. It was always appreciated and we felt very much valued for giving this kind of ministry. But back to the beginnings of the time after the wall had been built. During the first years, the East German congregations were very much isolated. There was no official contact to World Church or other congregations in the West allowed. However, visitors kept contact informally, using family relationships as reasons to travel or coming as tourists. All visitors from the West had to apply for an entry visa and give a reason for visiting. Regular visitors were Johnny Stabenow and Walter Lipper, who had family in Großregen. You can see Walter Lipper in the middle of this picture. He is over 90 years old now and still alive and involved in church life. Georg Sofke had a sister in Dresden and was another regular visitor. World Church employees were Joe Bayless, who lived in West Germany at that time, and Hank Compier, the bishop, who lived in the Netherlands. They came to visit on a tourist visa. In talking with some people during our interviews, we heard several stories of how ministers from the West visiting the church in the GDR at times had to turn into smugglers. Let's hear how Jennifer Stabner remembers this time. You may have to turn up your sound a little bit because the video is a little bit quiet, I think. We packed the car for a trip to East Germany. The country was called the Democratic Republic of Germany, although nothing was democratic. I was invited to be one of the guest speakers at a ladies' retreat in Großreichen. Johnny thought it best not to bring the children with us. We dropped them off with Johnny's mother and an aunt on the way. 
Georg Sofka, who previously lived a floor below us, traveled to Berlin on the same day. We planned to meet at a rest stop on our way. Since we both had the same model of Ford, it would be easy to spot the other's car. Three highways with border crossings led from West Germany into East Germany. Only one permitted West Germans to drive to Berlin. A person with a DDR visa could still exit from the main road into East Germany. West Berlin was like an island in the middle of the DDR. West Berlin was democratic like West Germany. The German Democratic Republic was under Russian influence and Russian military still occupied the land. When we reached the border of Marienborn, cars lined up in many lanes. Signs directed drivers to the lanes for Berlin and the others pointed to all other parts of the DDR. Georg, who would be traveling to Berlin, would only be checked for the necessary paperwork. He would be more thoroughly checked on the return trip to make sure he did not hide anyone inside his car. We, on the other hand, were checked more thoroughly. The guards ascertained that we did not bring any Western propaganda into the country. Anything printed after 1961 was not allowed in the country, since it might influence the residents on how different the West was from the East. We also needed the paperwork to register with the police when we arrived at our destination, including custom sheets and advisement on what we could not bring out of the country. Georg breezed through the border check and was already waiting at the first rest area. The parking lot at the rest area was an open parking lot. No trees grew there. No public table, picnic tables were available for people. Guard towers in the horizon could be seen. They could watch the vicinity with their binoculars and see every moment. We pulled up our car directly behind Georg. He took his briefcase out of his car and placed it on top of our trunk. John did the same with his briefcase. The cases were identical. It was customary that men often put their sandwiches in their briefcases. We had a little break, ate our sandwiches, and chatted before we continued our journey. Only later did Johnny reveal what happened at the parking lot. Georg took Johnny's briefcase, and Johnny took Georg's, which was full of ch church books. Johnny didn't want me to be scared, since we were smuggling materials into the East. He knew the punishment was years in prison. My face paled. I did not want to see my ch I did want to see my children again. Johnny informed me that he and Georg did this many times without being caught. It was the only way the members in the East could get anything up to date about the church. The story that Jennifer told is co confirmed by a similar story that Lothar Jeske told us in an interview. He remembers going with his father, Siegfried Jeske, to meet Georg Sofke at a rest area that was not quite as open as the one Jennifer described, along the transit autobahn from West Germany to West Berlin. Despite the danger of being observed, Siegfried and Georg managed to transfer a whole trunk full of Book of Mormons into Siegfried's car. It really is a wonder they did not get caught. If you think about it, that was a pretty risky time. In the late 60s and early 70s, there were some real efforts made to get the youth and young adults together nationwide for retreats. They had annual camps and met in Großreschen or the area around Dresden and Brandenburg, the three congregations we had in East Germany. They would either stay in tents at a camping place or stayed in people's homes. Sigrid Spring from Dresden, who you can see on the picture on the left, 
is recalling that they had an apartment with two small bedrooms and washing facilities in the kitchen, but five people would stay overnight. She says it's difficult to comprehend today how that was possible. So let's talk about the second of the congregations a bit. This is Brandenburg. The congregation was established in 1926. There were two pastors in the 1960s and 70s, incidentally, both Alfreds, Alfred Pollack and Alfred Orban. Alfred Orban was also the mission president in East Germany, but since he lived in Brandenburg, he played a major role there as well. For many years, the group met in living rooms in the apartments of the different families. And then in the mid 1970s, Alfred and his wife Gertrude built a house. When the group became too large to meet in living rooms, Alfred added another room onto the side of the house to be used as a meeting room for the congregation. And though this picture is much later, this is from the 1980s, it's a youth camp, you can see here this room, it's attached to the house, but it has a completely um, separate entrance and it was just really used for the church. Rudi Steckelmann, whom you can see here with his wife Ute, became the pastor sometime in the 1970s and led the congregation for many years. Now let's talk a little bit about Alfred, Alfred Orban, since he played such a central role for the church in East Germany. He was the mission president from 1948 to 1978. Alfred and his wife Gertrude made the conscious decision to stay in the East, even though both of their children decided to live in the West. But Alfred wanted to ensure that the church was able to continue despite the sometimes difficult situation in the GDR. In talking to some people, to people, some remember him as being stern, but also full of humor. My mother says that he was the most caring man that she can remember. We lived next door to the Orbans, and she says Alfred would make it a point to come over and say hello every single day. Gisela Arndt has the following memory of Alfred. Let's hear her story in German. It's rather short. I will give you, I will give you the English translation right afterwards. Aber Watter sehr war hilfsbereit. Mhm. Wenn der gekommen ist oder nach Grünberg gefahren ist, der hat sich immer erst ausgezogen, hat geholfen und dann hat er gesagt, und abends haben sie dann über Kirche gesprochen, mhm. oder? So she says, but one thing, he was always helping out when he came to visit or passed through on his way to Grünberg. He always first changed into work clothes and helped out. And in the evenings, they would sit down and talk about church. And that's how I remember him too, always busy, always helping out. Alfred was admired by many, but also, as with many people in leadership roles, his authority was challenged by some, apparently particularly by the Großrätischen Congregation. Let's hear how Joe Bayless remembers this. Okay, Alfred Urban lived in an isolated situation, and I'm sure it affected how he related to those in uh, the DDR or the German Democratic Republic. He did tell me that he was seen by all the members in small groups as a helpful minister. It was, however, not seen by the leadership in Grossration, the largest congregation, the same way. Uh, they managed their own congregation and didn't need his direction. This led to me telling Alfred that uh, we should try to make a trip to Grossration on my next trip to Leipzig. We did this, and it was a rather tense visit. There was a bishop's agent who was not friendly at all to Alfred, and I forget his name right now. Plus, there was Siegfried Jeske, who was the leading elder. I let them know that the leadership of the entire world church was directed by prophetic and apostolic leadership. We had no congregation anywhere in the world which just existed on its own. That I was the German mission president approved by World Converse Action, and this included East and West Germany, and that Alfred Urban was approved by World Conference, although his name was never mentioned in World Conference minutes, and we needed to find ways to allow Grossration to also function in this same process. It, it got quite tense. It was also at this time that I became aware that Alfred was really alone and maybe at times was not the easiest man to work with. 
But difficult man or not, he was a driving force. At the same time, there were rumors that he built his house in Brandenburg at the cost of the church. There were apparently some rather Nazi discussions and he denied these charges. I asked my mother about the situation and she says that the charges cannot be true. My stepfather and Alfred built their houses at just about the same time and together they went, like it was done in those days because you couldn't really buy building materials at hardware stores easily. So they went to get bricks off old houses that were being torn down. However, church members volunteered to help build his house. And so maybe some assumed that if church members helped to build the house, the materials must also have been bought with church funds. Probably in part because of these accusations, Alfred and Gertrude decided to give the house to the church. He also adamantly refused to accept a subsidy to his retirement in later years. As a church minister, his retirement income was minimal, but he would not accept the extra money the church offered him, much to the dismay of Gertrude. The extreme attitude about finances may have been part of the reason why it was so hard to find a successor for Alfred. At the same time, Alfred apparently had a rather hard time letting go of his leadership role as well. So again, let's hear what Joe Bates remembers in regards to the changes of leadership. As Alfred grew older, his wife developed cancer and it became more clear changes were needed. And since the World Church had sort of led, let this development uh, go on, it would probably take the, the World Church to help change it. I remember I had been transferred out of Germany, but the then Apostle J.C. Stewart felt we needed to help Alfred retire. It, he wasn't going to go easily, everyone knew. I was reassigned for a spell to Germany for the specific reason to help Alfred retire. I remember writing to Alfred that I was coming in to visit and wanted to go to Grosseration and have a conference together with them. I knew I had to tell Alfred he was retiring. I went to Brandenburg first, where Alfred and his wife lived, and we would travel together to the conference in Grosseration. I just didn't find the time or get the courage up to uh, tell Alfred of this change we were going to make in Brand while we were in Brandenburg visiting with them. So we drove in separate cars to Grosseration. I remember passing him on the Autobahn and motioning for him to exit, the next exit, rest stop. He did it and I told him there that he was going to retire at the conference in Grosseration and that we would elect a new leader for the church in the German Democratic Republic. He was very quiet. I told him the apostle was requesting I do this at the conference and I told him I would open up the conference for their nominations. No comment for, from Alfred, he just kind of listened. At the conference, I told them we had two orders of business. The first was to accept Alfred's resignation as leader of the church in the German Democratic Republic, and then to select a new leader. Everyone at the conference was stunned they had never had this authority to select a leader. And many were pleased to have Alfred do it all, but others knew it had to be done. I asked them to stand in appreciation of the years of Alfred's ministry. And then I dropped the bombshell with this question. Who would you like to nominate as your new leader? Alfred quickly got up and nominated Manfred Jeske. He said Manfred's a 70, but he was also aware that Manfred was one who didn't cherish administrative leadership. I then said that as a 70, he would not be encouraged to take on an administrative role, but that is seldom done. And asked, who else would you nominate? Who do you feel God is calling now to lead this mission in the DDR. After a lengthy pause, Siegfried stood up and told of a dream he'd had. 
where he felt he'd been called. Immediately his wife screamed out loud at the conference, no, no, and sobbed uncontrollably. It was very tense, but we voted and Siegfried was elected. Alfred was never the same toward me again, but I think he knew it was the right thing to do, and so the church continued. Like Joe said, Alfred's successor as the leader of the East German church was Siegfried Jeske. He remained in this position for only four years until his brother Manfred Jeske, who also happens to be Cassian's dad, took over. So here you have them. Here is Alfred in the middle, Siegfried right beside him, and Manfred on the other side. And then the bishop's agent that Joe talked about in the previous video, we couldn't remember the name, that is Helmut Lippa right here on the side. Well, one of Alfred Oban's dreams was to have a children's camp like they had in West Germany. Many efforts went into exploring this idea. And in 1980, the first children's camp was held in Großregen. There were tents set up in the parking lot behind the church building, and many people helped out in different ways. The main person, however, and the most important role played Renate Oemichen. You can see her here on the right with her youngest son. She had four children herself. With love and patience and truly recognizing the worth of all, she led children's camps for many years. And I would say it is to her credit that there are still so many of us who attended her camps active in church. From that year on, we had annual children's camps. One of the early children's camps took place in Brandenburg in the Garden of the Urbans. And since this is when I got to know the RLDS church, maybe this is a good time to tell a bit about my own personal story. I grew up in the Lutheran church, but my parents were not very religious. Like I mentioned before, we were next door neighbors with the Urbans, but at the same time, they were almost like grand grandparents for my sister and me. I remember Gertrude taking care of my sister and me when our parents were busy many times. In return, when their health started failing, a very simple alarm system was installed between our two houses where they could press one button and it would ring in our house and so my parents could go and check on them. So the two families had a good relationship. However, I do not remember ever hearing about the RLDS church until 1982, when one of the children's camps was to take place in Brandenburg in their garden. Alfred visited my sister and me Alfred invited my sister and me to participate, and I loved the experience. At age 12, theology and doctrines didn't mean all that much to me. It was more the very family-like atmosphere that I enjoyed, and the theme of peace that was even touched on in a children's camp. You have to remember that this was a time of the Cold War. In school, there was a constant talk of how NATO was planning on attacking the Eastern Bloc and how the Warsaw Pact had to keep up with the armaments race. Hearing about peace, even in simple ways in a children's camp, made an impression on me. At this first camp, I made several friends and many other camps followed, children's camps and later on youth camps. And though this is not a photo of that camp, it's the one of the next year, and here you see Alfred again, in Gosration in the basement of the church there. A highlight for the East German church was the visit of Prophet President Wallace B. Smith in 1983. Since my dad was in the church leader at the time, most of the guest ministers would stay in our home. I usually had to give up my room, but I didn't mind. Quite contrary, I felt rather important having apostles and at this time even the church president staying in my room and being able to meet them on such a personal level. That's actually something I really appreciate about our church, the very down-to-earth approach of and to leadership. Harry Eschenhurst, whom you can see in this picture, was a regional administrator at this time. And he continued to work, he continued the work that Joe Bayless had begun, trying to help us much as possible in the process of writing bylaws and getting the church officially recognized as church in the DDR. Even though guest ministers from the West became more bold in coming and giving ministry, 
it also became more risky and it was really important to get official recognition so guest ministers could come legally and preach officially. However, it was a lengthy process. In the meantime, the members of the different groups and congregations in the East visited each other often and enjoyed each other's fellowship and supported each other in ministry as much as they could. Here you can see members from Dresden and Großregen visiting up in the north in Grünberg. There was also a real need arising for Melchizedek priesthood in East Germany. Alfred Oban, the main missionary in 70, was getting old. And Manfred Jeske had been ordained as 70 in 1974, but that was it. In 1982, we had the first patriarch ordained in East Germany, and that was Ewald Edel from Dresden. So let's talk a little bit about Dresden. Ewald Edel was a pastor of that congregation since 1965, but the group had started already in 1948. Initially, they met in various homes, in a restaurant, and even in the waiting room of a dental office. When Ewald Edel became the pastor, he gave to disposition the basement in a house he owned to be used for church gatherings. Ewald also mentored a young man, Joachim Schöne, who had married into the church, and he took over leadership of the congregation from Ewald by 1982. Joachim and his family lived in the apartment above the church facilities, and they were generous hosts of many church activities, especially youth gatherings. The picture on the right shows him with his wife, Honey, and the regional administrator, Chuck Church. This is a copy from the Saints Herald. Joachim had a great talent organizing things and became soon very influential as counselor to Manfred Jeske, the church leader at the time. The other counselor was Siegfried Fillinger from Grünberg in the north. These three, Manfred Jeske, Joachim Schöne and Siegfried Fillinger had finally an appointment with the state office for church questions in the summer of 1984. Joachim Schöne later recalls that they were individually greeted by name when they went into the office, which meant that the government officials had had an eye on them way before and knew exactly who they were. But it was a very positive meeting with good results. The church leaders assured that the laws of the country would be res respected by quoting Romans 13, submission to governing authorities, and they had to agree on that the church in East Germany would function on its own rights and would finance itself. Results of the meeting were that entry visas for guest ministers could be applied for. The church could also apply for travel visas for ministers to travel outside of East Germany. The church could officially import church literature with a copy of the material to the state office. And the church could officially hold retreats. So 1984 was an important year. Now we could act more official, but it did take another year until an attestation of the official registration of the church was sent to the church leaders. Here you can see the document dated January 1986. This is actually something we are very proud of. The fact that our church was officially recognized as a religious denomination in East Germany. In West Germany, we were and still are registered as an association. Again, it was Brother Orban who had a dream of a camp in the GDR, and this time it was a family camp. Joachim Schöne, who you can see here on the very right again, with his organizational talent, saw different opportunities and approached an elderly church couple, Harry and Hildegard Bernd, who are seated right in the middle here. The Bands had a large property just outside of Dresden. Everybody stayed in tents, a garden hose served as a shower, meals were cooked on camping stoves, and we met for all activities underneath a large tree. Georg Sofke and his daughter Daniela came from West Germany and brought important ministry. Among other things, they introduced us to the idea of campfire programs and much more. Unfortunately, Brother Orban was not able to experience this dream come, become, become reality. He died that summer before we had the camp. 
1984 was also the year when youth activities took a real leap. There were several youths my age, around 15 plus minus a couple of years. We were too old for children's camp, but loved it so much that we kept going as staff. That year's children's camp had 33 participants, but there also arose the need for the youth to have their own camps. And so different church members began inviting us for weekend gatherings, and we, st we started the tradition of a New Year's camp in East Germany. The first one took place in the home of Hani and Joachim Schöne in Dresden, and here you can see a photo of the group that gathered that first New Year's. Other church members who invited us were Uschi and Günther Novak from Halle. You can see Uschi here on the very left. Gisela and Günther Arndt in Berlin. You see them too here. And later also Hildegard and Siegfried Fillinger in Grünberg. During annual conferences in Großreichen, the young people would often meet in the evenings at the Jeskes house and here are the Jeskes. It is hard to say which family was most important to the youth. So let's just take the Arndt family as an example, but similar stories can be applied to several others. The Arndt family opened their home to the youth, both for youth weekends, but also just for young people to come and visit. Many took advantage of that, my sister being one of them. Another young man, Mike, practically lived with them for a time when he was in the army and it was too far for him to go home on short leave weekends. The aunts did not have much space in their house. And so for youth weekends, they would actually sleep in their car so that three of the girls could share their bed. Others slept on the floor wherever there was space. On this photo on the right here, you can see Gisela on the very top and her mother. Down here, that is her son Michael, the one that we talked about in the very beginning that was six months old in 1961. And this year, is the Mike I talked about that practically moved in with them for a while. The aunts lived in Berlin, the capital of the GDR, and Berlin was better supplied with food and other items than the rest of the country. And also, Gisela worked at the grocery store and had access to things that were hard to get. But they shared generously whatever they had. And in general, it can be said that there was an extraordinary generosity among the members in the East. Most people did not have much but all were eager to share what they had. After the official meeting in Berlin, it was now possible to get official guest ministers. Tom and Erlene Campbell came in the summer of 1985 as guest ministers from the British Isles for the children's and family camp. Here you can see Christine Fillinger translating for Tom. By then I had realized that it does come handy knowing English. I did not want to learn English at first. I remember hard discussions with my mother that I will never be able to go to those countries where they speak English. In East Germany, we all had to learn Russian in school from fifth grade on. And then in seventh grade, you could choose another foreign language. However, you needed to have two foreign languages if you wanted to go on to high school. Well, mothers usually know best, so I learned English. And even though it took a while before I dared to speak English publicly, it did come in handy, helping the guest ministers who stayed in our home. And I also remember translating some short stories from the Daily Bread. My dad did not know any English, so I could help him in communicating with church officials, at least on a basic level in the beginning. <clears throat> a really big event for us was that he was allowed to travel to World Conference in 1986. The government didn't make it easy for him. He was not allowed to exchange any money and he did not know until the last minute whether he really would be allowed to travel or not. So without any dollars and without any English, just with a name and a phone number of a church member in New York on a piece of paper, he went over the big pond. I would call this a real act of faith. He recalls this as an experience he will never forget. And speaking about languages, a funny thing he recalls is that he was asked by several young people to say something in Russian. My dad does not speak Russian. He speaks German, period. No English, no Russian either. These young people were under the impression that everybody in East Germany is forced to speak Russian. That was not so. We all had to learn it in school, but that was after my dad went to school and we did not have to speak it anywhere other than in school. 
Another real highlight in our church life was a European leaders meeting held in Großregen. We had leaders coming from both East and West Germany, the Netherlands, Great Britain, Norway, and the US. You can see Joe Sirik, who was the apostle at this time here in the front row. For the opening meeting, even state officials were invited and that was the first time they were officially in our church. It was a very special event and everybody who was there is still talking about this special gathering. Again, Joachim Schöne proved to be a real organizational talent. Plus we got good help with supplies from John Menzies, a church member who worked as cultural attaché at the American embassy in East Germany. John Menzies, later being president of Graceland College, served in different countries in the East Bloc and had been able to get exchange students to Graceland from both Hungary and Bulgaria. He did not succeed to set up an official exchange program from East Germany, but he was instrumental in finding sponsors for getting Eva, me and another young man, Gerd Oemichen, to Graceland right after the wall came down. We went in 1991, and while there were church members grumbling that we would not come back, here we are back in Europe, still playing an important role in the life of the church in Germany and Norway. John Mances opened his house for gatherings and offered his help in many different ways. My dad and also Joachim Schön and their spouses were even invited to a reception at the house of the American ambassador on Independence Day. That was very impressive. Joachim Schöne recalls that the whole street around the embassy was blocked off. And when they came driving with their little Trabant, the common car in East Germany, the guards did not want to let them through, but they produced proudly the invitation and were able to get in. John Mansis knew very well that he was watched by the East German state security. There was, for example, a road construction in front of his apartment that never got finished. Instead, it was used as a place to keep an eye on him and other Western embassy personnel. Being church members and having contacts to the West, we all knew that we were being watched. However, the amount of information and the details the state security had was astonishing. Here you can see a page from their files, which my dad requested after the re German reunification. This is a copy of a picture from the Saints Herald that Johnny Stadno had sent to my parents to let them know that there was a report on the European leaders meeting in the Saints Herald. So letters were opened, copied and filed. Another page from the files of the state security informs about the fact that the priest Jan Waldemar Stadno had been praying for Mr. Gorbachev that Gorbachev may continue to function as driving belt for peace and easing of tension in the world. Interesting, but since politics got involved, they saw this information as something worthwhile to report. Knowing that we were watched and listened to did not make missionary work easy. However, it also brought us together in a rather special way. As a daughter of the church leader at the time, I was very emerged in church life and everything was rather natural. However, my personal phase really developed when I became friends with Eva after those early children's camps. We got closer together during youth camps and she started asking all those questions, why things are this way or that way in our church. Questions I hadn't really asked myself because that's what I had grown up with. So trying to answer her questions, I had to figure out a lot for myself. And since we never lived in the same town and did not have a telephone, I can tell you there were many letters written by hand and sent back and forth. When World Church opened for ordination of women, it became a topic in East Germany too, of course. Just like everywhere else, there were a few rather conservative members, but generally the situation in East Germany was much more fruitful for women's ordinations since men and women in the society at large had pretty much equal rights. It was very usual and even necessary for women to go to work and most of them did work full time even. So it did take some time to get started, but in April, 1989, we had the first woman in East Germany, Sigrid Spring from Dresden, ordained as a teacher. And in October, 1989, 
one month before the wall came down. Heike Fillinger, whom you can see in this picture on the right, and I were ordained to be a priest. This is a picture of our active group of young adults, and there are even three young Americans visiting on that day. There is so much more that could be shared, but our time is up. But before we give you our conclusion, maybe we should say another word or two about life in East Germany in general to give a bit of a clearer picture. Our parents' generation was in their teenage years or early 20s in the 1960s. And so for them, it was a tragedy when the war was built. Our generation was born into the reality of the Iron Curtain. We were sort of used to the facts of life. What were the facts of life? As a child from a church going family, you had to be very careful what you said and where. In school, you had better not talk too much about church. In fact, I myself had the experience that my class teacher in my last year of middle school wrote a very simple sentence on my grade report. Ava regularly goes to church. And that simple sentence made it close to impossible for me to go on to high school. My parents managed to get me into high school after all, but that was not in my hometown. One could make things easy for oneself by becoming a member of the Socialist Party or volunteering long time for the army. Then your path was pretty smooth, even when you were not so bright. But refusing to become a member of the Socialist Party meant that you really had to prove yourself and work harder on everything. It was, however, rather incidental how much repressions you would face. When you met the wrong people, they could really mess up your life. And many faced the same problems as Eva did. I personally was lucky not to experience this. However, I was also very careful about what I said to whom. When there were things going on at church and school at the same time, I would always go to the activities in school and never use the excuse that I had to go to a church. I have one key memory of the spring after the wall came down when we all went to West Germany for the first German-German conference. Eva was going to be baptized and I wanted to buy some flowers for her. We stayed with Mary and Les Blanchard at the time and when we stopped at the gas station, Mary told the clerk that we were on our way to a church conference and needed flowers as a gift for a baptism. I just about fainted at a gas station to a complete stranger. She was talking about going to church. I would have never done that in East Germany. At the same time, life under such restrictions meant that people, though there was the constant threat of your friends being spies for the Stasi, but people had a much closer relationship to each other. There was a sense of solidarity that disappeared pretty quickly when the war came down and materialism moved in. And also, as Kerstin mentioned in her story about women's ordination, gender equality, which here means equality between men and women, was lived in a way that I have not seen since. Men and women were expected to work equally, with many women doing traditional men's jobs. There are some political and economic explanations for this, but that was a fact of life for us. So how did life behind the Iron Curtain shape today's church and church leaders? Because of the general situation in the country, relationships could be really strong and deep. In a restrictive society like we had in East Germany, you didn't always know whom to trust. It was the churches that provided a safe space. In churches, the East German peace movement was able to thrive. And in churches, you were able to talk freely for the most part. Under these circumstances, relationships built on trust could be formed and were able to be long lasting and important to people. For instance, within our church, there developed a core group of six youth. In this picture here, you, you see the six of us. We had a very strong bond. Two of us were not born into the church, and you may wonder how we did missionary work when we did not dare to talk to strangers about church. Our emphasis then was on friendship evangelism, meaning that we first built friendships with people and then invited them to camps, and this proved to be a good tool. And another point, Due to the border prohibiting us from traveling anywhere in the West, we couldn't go to any private places for vacations. That meant that we had a lot of time and also the desire to go to church camps and also to privately meet each other often. This helped to develop deep friendships and shaped us for a large part of our lives. 
as a core group, we started organizing our own youth camps. But we were also given a lot of freedom in this. Many camps happened without any official supervision or guest ministers. We ran the whole camp ourselves, and that taught us invaluable leadership skills. We were involved in many aspects of church life. That may seem normal in today's world as well, but it seems to me, looking back, that we played an unusually big part in church life. And the worth of all persons was lived out in many ways. I remember attempting to learn playing the trumpet together with my friend Miriam. We were quite the beginners, having just practiced for a few months and surely did not sound so great. Yet we were asked to play for a service in Gosration, and even after that not so wonderful performance, we were encouraged to keep giving ministry in congregations. So even though life in East Germany was restrictive and maybe even oppressive, in church we found sort of a safe space. There was a vibrant church life, many activities were going on throughout the year, and activities were well attended. So this is all for this time. We do want to acknowledge the two main written sources we used. Uh, most of the early dates are taken from the German church history by Gerhard Schöpke and the history of the congregation Großregen by Siegfried Jeske. We also talked to many people, like we said in the beginning, and we want to thank everybody for their willingness to help. And thank you for attending this rather lengthy lecture. Wow, wow, wow. Well, thank you so much, Kirsten and Ava. It was wonderful. You might even say wunderbar, or I might even use my favorite <laughs> German word, ausgezeichnet. <laughs> What an extensive research that you have done for this presentation. And yet you were still both able to add such a personal touch. So feel and dunk. It was wonderful also to hear all of those different stories from different people that you inserted into your presentation who experienced the life of the church behind the Iron Curtain. But believe it or not, we have come to the end of our hour. And fortunately, Kirsten and Ava have agreed to stay a little bit longer to answer questions, but we know not everyone can stay with us past the hour, so we recognize some of you have to go to your other appointments and responsibilities. So thank you for coming, but we invite you to come back next week when we host Ben Smith. Ben will be sharing the story of Community of Christ in Australia in a presentation called Green Shoots, Tiona and the Green Cathedral from Inception into Tomorrow a continuing legacy of camping ministry and sharing the sacredness of creation. There's a lot of history in that title alone. So be sure to head over to the foundation's website to register for next week's lecture. And don't forget next week, we will begin at 7 p.m. Central time to accommodate our storyteller from Australia. But let's get back to today's program. And I think there's already some questions in the queue. Barb, what questions do you have to start us off today? Lots of questions. And our first question comes from Myra Elliott. And Myra asks, can you identify the people in the picture that we have seen for this program? Now that uh, question arrived, I think, before um, we had a chance to see the lecture. Um, I am guessing Myra is talking about the um, this image here. And uh, Kirsten and, and Eva, do you have any idea who I leave that to your casting. <laughs> I can <laughs> give it a shot. Well, it's Johnny Stabner on the very left. Mm. Uh, well, if we start in, in the back row, then it's Joe Bayless next to him, Leo van Klinken, and then Apostle, I believe, Dean Austin. I'm not quite sure. Then it's Case Compier. Um, yeah, Case Compier. Um, jo um, Georg. Sofke, well, now I'm back in the front row, Georg Sofke, uh, second and right in the front. Oh, it's difficult to, de to describe. <laughs> then Alfred Oban on the very right in the front row, behind the elderly gentleman, I do not know. And in the middle in the front row is Hank Compier, who was the bishop in the um, striped, not striped, was it? Kariat, Eva? <laughs> Uh, checkered in the checkered uh, jacket checkered. I do not know in front of him that should be Hugh Evans and the other person who is kneeling in front I do not know either 
but we didn't choose this picture. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I cannot tell you who all these people are. Um, this was just put in, yeah, in the beginning. I, it's, we didn't choose it. So I don't know, really. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have found out. Nope. Kirsten, you answered perfectly. Uh, while you were answering that question, and I was able to look into the information we have in the church archives, where this photo came from, and, and you named everyone that is in the records for uh, the church archives. So uh, congratulations, you weren't expecting <laughs> this question and you identified them all very, very well. Um, the, uh, the next question we have, let's uh, stop this share here. Um, Next question comes from Dion Young, and she says, there were lots of American soldiers and Department of Defense staff meeting in church groups in the 80s and 90s. Did they attend any of the German church meetings? I know my sister and brother, Jim and Judy Grayon, attended reunion in England. And then she comes back to say, just clarifying, the Americans would probably only be involved in West German churches. This report is mostly about East Germans. Yes, and yes. Okay. <laughs> so we yes, we it. were, yeah, we were talking about the church in East Germany, but um, Jim and, Je and Graham, um, what was it? No, Jim and Judy Graham, we have met. Um, they were active in the west uh, of Germany in Stuttgart, I believe, or Baumholder, one of the, so they were stationed in the west, and there was also church groups that met regularly with some American and I think also some German involvement. Well, our next question is a, a comment from Diane Mayfield, and she says, this is not a question, but a thank you. My parents and I went to Berlin a year after the wall went up. My dad, Harry Doty, and Lou Zonker crossed into the east to visit with Alfred Urban, while mom and I stayed with a church family in West Berlin. Thank you. The next question comes from Mike Overly, and Mike asks, could you share those references again? I would love to read more. They are in German, I believe. Yes. The, the references that I used is the Deutsche Kirchengeschichte from uh, Gerhard Schöpke. And the other one was the uh, History of the Congregation in Großregion by Siegfried Jeske. Both of those materials are in German. Thank you. Uh, the next comment comes from Jean Holmes, and Jean shares that the one on the far right in the back was my dad, Victor Witt. Um, she said this could have been taken in Hanover around 1955 through 57. I believe the picture was taken in Springer, in front of the church building in Springer. Mm -hmm. And that is it for the, the questions currently in the queue, but I encourage people to, to keep sending in those questions. We also had a number of wonderful comments made in the chat, of people connecting to uh, their trips to Germany or um, comments about the, uh, the lecture itself. And so I'd encourage you to, to take a look at the comments made in the chat. Yeah, there's a comment from Andrew Bolton that maybe it was John Boussou uh, in the checked jacket. That sounds about right, I think. That could be him. Yeah, and Jim and Julie were in Baumholder, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And Andrew, I see also now that Andrew Bolton also said Eric Rowe, top right, and Ed Barlow, bottom right. So obviously the the people, I, I didn't know any people from the British Isles at that time, <laughs> so I wouldn't <laughs> recognize them. But now I guess when we figured out everybody. Well, I have a question for you. Uh, considering all of the research and the incredible amount of work that you've done to pull this program together, which I could not thank you enough. I loved uh, the collection of storytellers that you brought together and the photos that you used to, to help depict history. Um, I imagine there's a lot of areas that you didn't cover. And if you could um, take on a second lecture, uh, what areas do you wish you could have dove into in this lecture? If time wasn't an issue, uh, what areas did you leave uncovered for this particular program that um, if, if you had all the time in the world, you'd go back and research? Well, it, you know, we, we chose a very specific, not all of Germany, just one part of Germany, not all of time frame, but just one part of time frame. But as I was talking to people, I realized that a huge part of the, of the German church in general came from 
the area of Silesia. I mentioned that in the beginning, the, the families in Grunberg came from that area, uh, which is in what's today Poland. There were two or three congregations, I don't know. They must have been pretty substantial. And as the war came to an end and the Russians were moving in, that whole group had to move more and more towards the West, so into Germany. And they settled where there was already church members before. And so there seems to be a lot of stories about these, um, the yeah, I mean, fleeing in that war and settling and hardships and how they managed to overcome and how they stuck together as a church group and, and built the congregations and built the church. I think that would be interesting to explore at some point. Well, we have more questions in the queue. Our next question comes from Bob Kaiser. And Bob asks, what are your thoughts about the future of the church in Germany? You want to should I? I leave it to you. <laughs> you are in Germany. <laughs> well, I, I think that was part of point of our presentation. That was kind of what got us to this presentation is that um, Germany went through a dry spell. We closed several congregations. The family camps were getting smaller and smaller. But it appears that the group in our age that was so active in East Germany and that, that was so self-driven like we said we had to organize or we did organize our own camps we didn't have anybody prodding us it was just our own doing because we wanted to it was something that we that we really felt strongly about and that group that was kind of drifting away for a while now seems to be coming back so just as an example reunion this year we would have had a lot of older generation people i think we had the majority was our age there were some younger, there were some older, but it was our age group that was presented pretty well. And if you look at the most of the activities now are online, of course, it's that age group that is doing a lot of the church work right now, not in official capacities necessarily, but but I, th I think the future looks pretty bright. I mean, whatever you call bright, but I think I felt more desperate before and now it looks better, I think. <laughs> Our next question comes from Justice Manning, and Justice asks, did the youth camps have to be held in secret? I, I missed the context. No, we didn't held them in secret. Actually, I was surprised too when I read that it was only after 1984 that they were officially allowed. Um, but we had them not really, really secret, but like I said, you did, wouldn't go out very public and announce them and, and yeah, make a big deal out of them, but not really, really secret in secret either. Carol Levenger uh, says, thanks Kirsten and Eva. You brought back many memories of when I was there. And also <laughs> I learned a lot of history. Thank you. She, she was in that one picture actually uh, of Kirsten's ordination. She, she was one of the three Americans visiting at that time. <laughs> Well, that's exciting. She also asked, did Manfred and Siegfried build the cross in secret at work for the church? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, again, I mean, um, yeah, it, it would be the same kind of answer, not making a big deal about it, <laughs> um, but using the, the work facilities to, to, to make the cross, yeah. Our last question comes from Mike Oberly and he writes, such a great presentation. Do you have thoughts or plans to explore more and perhaps do another at some point? You're already getting calls for an encore lecture. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> no plans, like say. no. <laughs> but we would love to have you back in the spring. Uh, thank you so much for what you've shared with us today. I think we are all ready to, to pick up a book on church history in Germany, or at least travel to, to Germany, where it sounds like history is being made even today. So, so thank you so much. Um, we, we did have a question come in just now from Dion Young, and uh, she writes, my sister remembers the story of not getting permission to build a new church. Um, so East Germany built a new church inside the existing one and tore the outside down later. Where was this church? 
Well, there was the one what I was talking about in Großregion. It was just the other way around. They they built, <laughs> they had the wooden barrack and then they built a stone building around the wooden barrack. And um, yeah, that's what I was talking about where they didn't get the permission. And then by the time they got to the roof, it got that big <laughs> and that high that um, people noticed what was going on. And then they were called in and had to justify themselves and pay a fine. But because there was already so much material used, they said, well, it wouldn't make sense to tear down again. So they were allowed to uh, continue. But also they, they did not get permission and they did not get permission in the beginning. And then it was actually someone who was giving them the hint that they could apply for value preservation. And then they would get the permission to do that at least so they, and then they would get started. So that was in Großregion, yeah. This history is so fascinating. Uh, Phyllis Weaver dropped a question in the chats and she asks, uh, can you tell us about Hani Urban? She was at Graceland in 1959. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just saw that question too. Yeah, so Hani is the daughter of, is one of the two daughters of um, Alfred and Gertrude. And yes, she was in Griffith. She, um, if you actually, if I could refer you to uh, Journey of a People, um, Volume 3, Mark Scherer writes quite a bit about Honey, actually. And then he totally doesn't write about uh, Doris, the other daughter at all. But for some reason, he writes about Honey a lot. So she married a, a man from Iraq, Iran, Iraq, Iraq. And um, they lived in Iraq for a bit. And then they lived in West Germany. Um, because her husband uh, had political problems in Iraq. But yeah, Honey is still alive. She's still in, in West Germany, close to Koblenz. And once in a while, we see her at church activities. So yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Barb, for asking those questions. And it's now time to bring our program to a close. So once again, thank you, Kirsten and Ava, for sharing your thoughts and your vast knowledge about Community of Christ history in Germany. There's so much to learn from our heritage in this part of the world, and your sharing of the brief period behind the Iron Curtain has certainly given us the urge to learn more about our heritage in Germany. So thank you. We also want to share thanks to our friends in the audience for joining us today, for your continuing passion for good stories, and for your generous support for the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation. Thank you for your generosity. I encourage you all to tune in next week as we hear from Ben Smith. And I shared earlier, Ben will be presenting on Green Shoots, Tiona and the Green Cathedral from Inception to Tomorrow, a continuing legacy of camping ministry and sharing the sacredness of creation. Wendy has already dropped a link to the Church History Without Boundaries webpage in the chat. So be sure to follow that link to register for next week's program which you all need to remember begins at 7 p.m. Central Time. So until next Thursday, take care, everyone. Keep reading your church history and have a great day.